I know I didn't specify meanings. All right, Wayne, tell me one of your must-know verbs with four principal parts. Go, and Very nice. <clears throat> That's a classic. It is. Well, they're all classics because they're all... Uh, and, yeah. Uh, it's actually just missus at the end, but you, you had most of it. All right, we're just going to take two, whoops, to start with. Okay. <clears throat> so today, we are going to be working with that third principal part. What did you used to know the third principal part as, or what did you only know it as? prior to today. Yep. And what person is it? So it's first person singular. Perfect tense. We are going to use that third principal part, not all of it, but we're going to use it to form two other tenses today. It's okay. It'll be fine. There are, so there are six. I'm gonna let them on fire. You can light the future perfect on fire. Yeah. Future perfect is only useful about you know four percent of the time. What? We're okay. So we're gonna take our third principal part in all of those must know verbs, and you're gonna take off. This is a subtraction sign. I'm going to take off the I. The thing that's left after you take off the I is something that we're going to be referring to often called the perfect stem. And if you know anything about botany, a stem is the thing upon which a flower grows. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, so here a stem is the thing that you're going to put endings on. And we talked about that a little bit in the perfect tense, too, right? The endings are e is the it, imus istos erunt, and you put those endings on top of the stem. You don't put them on top of the I that's already there, because the I that's already here is one of your endings. So you have to reduce it to the stem before you can do anything, really, with it. Therefore, what is the perfect stem of do dare? Right. And then what's the stem of mito? Mitter. Miss. Okay. The stem enables us to put on a whole host of endings. In the perfect tense, we put on perfect tense endings. So today we have two other tenses to learn, so two other sets of endings. Yes. Yes. I know. It's part of being in the A team. Very inspirational. So the first tense is uh, the Parker tense. It is the pluperfect tense. In English, we often refer to the pluperfect tense as something called the past perfect. The pluperfect tense is a verb that happened even before the perfect tense. Okay, let's put this in context. What's the translation of a perfect tense verb? Yeah. Something easy. Right, blanked. So in order then to do the pluperfect or the past perfect, we have to take this and put it even more in the past. Instead of walked, we need to do something else to it to make it happen even farther back in time. What little tiny English word should we use to make this a pluperfect verb versus a perfect? Did. Bless you. No, did is actually reserved for perfect tense. Wayne? What's that? Is it still going to be like, is it still going to be Yeah, there will be. So it can't be like, 
We were walking is imperfect, yeah, because it hasn't finished yet. Any other ideas? Yeah. Had. Had, exactly. <clears throat> Had blanked. Pluperfect is the only tense that uses had with something else. You cannot use had with perfect. You cannot use had with imperfect. Had is specifically a pluperfect thing. Yeah? Is there a Latin word for had? Or like you that right? Nope. It's embedded in the verb ending. So one Latin verb in involves usually three to four English words. That's why Latin is just a more efficient way of living. But you already knew that, which is why you're here. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with a perfect tense verb like walked, the pluperfect version that we're going to talk about is had walked. <clears throat> this also works for what they call irregular perfects in English. Um, what's a past tense that doesn't have ed at the end? Wrote. So she wrote a story. Whoops. Now English is getting funky here. What's the pluperfect version of this? Had wrote. Not had wrote. Written. She had written, exactly. Any questions so far about pluperfect usage? Yeah. The pluperfect is the only um, tense that has at, then had, like. Right. Right. And then contrast that. Taylor was reiterating what I had said previously that pluperfect is the only tense that has had in it. Now you might be thinking, well, I thought we learned something like that with perfect tense. Perfect tense is actually have, not had. I know. English, man. So confusing. I do not know how people learn it. That's true. That's true. Um, all right, so we have a pluperfect tense. We have past perfect. We have a perfect tense that's even more in the past than the perfect tense. So here's how we're going to form it in Latin. How to form pluperfect in Latin. It's pluperfect. So we are going to start with the perfect stem that we just talked about. And then we're going to add a series of endings. Now remember, we are trying to make this verb even more in the past than it is right now. So the endings, <clears throat> the thing that we're going to use for endings, hopefully looks a little bit familiar. Goes in height. Look familiar? What is it? Yeah. So can you be more grammatical then about what this is? Look, well, just grammatically identify what this thing is. What's that? <laughs> yes, it's a verb. When I first asked, what is this thing, Parker said, was. What is that grammatically? What is this thing? Grammatically, what verb is it? The verb to be, exactly. So this is sum essay in which tense? Not, not sufficient anymore. You, know, you now know three past tenses in Latin. No? Imperfect, yes. So sum esse. Watch your language, Porter. That was not called for. So it's the imperfect tense of sum esse. So we are complementing then 
a past tense with a past tense so that we can get a past past. So if I have to add the, a word onto a word in a way? Yes. But I don't, just don't get into the habit that you can just do this willy-nilly whenever you choose. I'm just introducing it as this is the pattern that exists here. Yeah. Taylor? I might be jumping up a little bit, but if, um, but if we have, like, um, like Missy, uh, you take away the I, and let's say we have Aramus, wouldn't it be Miss Aramus? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let's do what Taylor is alluding to. We'll do a sample. So here we have... One of our must-know verbs, which, of course, you all know. Our first objective is to take the perfect stem, which here is mis. And then you're going to add that. So we get mis eram. Mis eras. I didn't mean to leave a space. I just wanted to demonstrate that it's a perfect stem and then an ending. So Taylor's at translation, I had, and then this is one of those irregular English past tense. I had sent, you had sent, he had sent. Thankfully, they have this consistent had thing, okay? We had sent, y'all had Sent. It's a nice consistent translation all the way through. They had sent. So when you think about the pluperfect, it actually makes sense that it's even more in the past than the past, right? So we had sent the letters out before we heard about the tragedy. So heard is a simple past tense slash perfect tense, but we need some sort of verb tense to express something that might have happened before. Yes, sir? That's the only way you can translate it. Yeah. Yep. Catch point two. There is none. It seems too comprehensible for Latin. <laughs> I mean, there's kind of kind of catch with it, like, oh, no. well, on this part has this in there. Is it? No, this is it. That's why it's possible to learn two verb tenses in one day, because this one is not that bad. No. Um, in your notebooks, I'd like for you to do, um, we did de, do dare dedi datus. I would like for you to put do dare dedi datus into pluperfect, English and Latin. This is another one that's going to be kind of funky in its English. So let's see what you do with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, please provide the English also.
All right, um, Isabella, can you do singulars for us? Just Latin? Oh, I said um, better on, better off, and better off. Excellent. <coughs> um, Grace, can you do plurals for us? Um, Tanner, what's your proposal to translate Deuteronomy? Great. Excellent. I'm not going to write it all out because it's very consistent, as, as we said earlier. I had given, you had given, he had given. It's all the same. Okay? You know, I had given out my Easter eggs before the second crop of kids arrived. So arrived is a nice clean cut past tense. Had given takes place before the arrived. Does that make sense? How to use the tense? Yeah? Okay, stand up for a quick brain break before we do the second one. Yeah. All right, we're gonna do uh, X pop and wiggle. Uh, cross your arms out in front of you. You're going to take your right um, arm and start patting down to a nice beat. Once you got a nice beat going, take your left hand and hit it at your wrist. If you think you've got it, switch. Oh, wow. Okay. I'm horrible on this side. Right? <laughs> Switching. <laughs> I was yeah. fine with the right side. <laughs> All right, have a seat. All right, our second tense, because the first one was not too bad, and you guys are very capable is a very odd duck tense called the future perfect. So in the future perfect tense, we have the uh, dubious privilege of marrying the future to the perfect. How on earth can you possibly do this in English? No, no. Yeah, well, more specifically, will have blanked. I know, it's really awkward. I mean, how often do you use the future perfect? It has some limited applications. Um, a lot of random fun runs in two weeks. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, as of June, I will have been a teacher for 13 years, so there's that, but I mean, it's, when do you use that? I don't know, I mean, oh. it has some application, yeah. We were going to like a, a bank loan, and they want to figure out your capacity. I will have earned this much money. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. That's just future. I will be staying at the Sheridan. I will be in Disney World. That's future, future, future. Yeah, yeah. You know, at this time next week, I will have been on vacation for two weeks or something like that, you know? It is. But I, I think that there are some very random opportunities in your life where the future perfect will present itself. Look for it. Between Wednesday, Thursday, Friday this week, see if you find yourself saying the future perfect at some point. Try to, you know, take a voice memo of yourself using a future perfect. What's that? Well, you don't have to do it at the bank. It's not every day. Yeah. All right. In our Latin, we are still joining the future and the perfect by doing this. We are starting with, that's right, 
the perfect stem. Because that's where. Is that a good one again? The third one. Yep, third principal part minus the I. After the perfect stem, we don't need to make it more in the past. We actually have to put it kind of in the future. So we are going to add endings that look like this. See what we did there? What is this thing that I'm writing here? What is this? This thing. Yeah. It's the future tense of some essay. Exactly. So it's our irregular future tense from sum essay. Ero, eris, erit. Now, conjugate with me aloud. Ero, eris, erit, eremis, eritis, erunt. Exactly. That's what the future tense looks like in sum. However, there's a problem. What's the problem? You already have what? Yes, you do. Where do you have erunt currently? Say it again. Not blue perfect, but perfect. So errunt is our, um, what's that? Well, I guess so. Um, errunt is already used in the perfect tense for third person plural. And Latin has a lot of endings that it makes you memorize, right? So on one hand, it's like, oh, it's another ending. But at least it doesn't do the same thing to you twice, right? It will never say errunt could be two different things, right? Because that would be really annoying. So instead, we are actually going to change it for the sake of our future perfect to erint, which is unexpected, but necessary. Of course, this blows out of water my um, mandate many moons ago. I said, there's no such thing as INT. I don't know if you knew that, but when I was saying that phrase, there was an asterisk when I said it, because there is kind of an INT. But it's actually part of something larger. It's not just INT as an ending. So it'd be mitso Let's do mito mitere, my friend. So Jihan wants to start with mitere. So his first person singular is right on target, mis ero. Yep. Good. And then what is our super duper rare future perfect translation of first person singular? I would I would have said. Yep. What about second person? And so on and so forth. Good. So now you know two new tenses. See, it was a productive day after all. <clears throat> now, this sample that we just conjugated here, and we also trans uh, conjugated 
the pluperfect before. So we have words here like this, miseris, and then we have, let's say, miserimus. This is a, a quick piece of advice for the rest of your Latin career. Oh, ye who like to use dictionaries, you know who you are. It is very easy to see a word like this, and the first thing that you do is you go to the dictionary and you look up this thing, and the first thing that you see for this is What is this? Sad. It's an adjective. Say it again. Well, I don't want to, I'm not here to make you feel bad about <laughs> looking something up in the dictionary. <clears throat> but it's easy to get stuck in the trap of, oh, miser, okay, there's, there's someone who's sad in the sentence. And I'm sure that the IS thing will just figure itself out. It won't. You have to be a lot more critical when you look at words that you're trying to look up in the dictionary. You have to know that this is a verb. Where do verbs always hang out? Yeah. At the end of the sentence. Right. So verbs at the end of phrases slash sentences. So just check the context of what you're looking up before you look it up. It's one thing to look up miseries from the middle of the sentence and assume, yeah, sure, it means sad. But if miseries is at the end of the sentence, if the context has nothing to do with being sad, but the context is about a letter that one person is sending to another, or that one person is blanking to another, it's probably not a sad letter. It's probably not a sad person sending the letter, right? So. Think a little bit more critically. The problem is that most perfect stems are not identical to the first principle part. You just have to know. You have to know all the parts of a verb in order to really make sense of it. You have to know that mito is related to miseris. You have to know that do dare or dot or something is related to dedit. This is why the must-know verb list is a really core function of your Latin 1 experience, so that you kind of understand the integ integral nature of all these verbs. Okay? We will work more with these verbs tomorrow. Thank you for all your patience as we started class today. I'm sorry about the lock incident. Sorry about the swivel thing. But I appreciate y'all understanding. All right. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah.